It's always fun watching the countdown timer going like, oh, 10, 9, no, do it in your head. It's really fun. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Jimmy. I, I work at a company called D2IQ. Um, I'm principal architect, principal engineer there. I've um, been working with Kubernetes for, I don't know, seven, eight years, something like that, um, across lots of it, mainly in the ecosystem rather than core Kubernetes. Um, so I love all the CNCF projects that we've got. I love putting them together, building up um, solutions from them and, and contributing to them and building stuff around it. So we're going to talk um, today about uh, a distributed ingress. So as I've been working with Kubernetes a long time and I'm sure you, are, have you, do you all work with Kubernetes? But, yeah, vast majority. So I saw someone waving, that's great, I like that. I'll just put a hand up, give it a good wave, yes. Um, and quite often when we talk about Kubernetes, we talk about a single cluster, we're talking about we deploy our apps to a single cluster and maybe we deploy it to other clusters, but the kind of multi-cluster discussion isn't, isn't solved yet. I think there's loads of opportunity upstream um, I used to be the maintainer of KubeFed, which was Federation V2 in, in Kubernetes before we archived it. Um, and there's loads of scope in the SIG multi-cluster if, if you want to do stuff there, by the way. There's, there's loads of stuff around multi-clustering that, that we need to, to fix in the, and, and improve in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So we can talk about distributed ingress. And what I mean by distributed ingress is I want users to not know that they're talking to multiple clusters. I want our users that are accessing our applications, whether that's your internal applications on your, your intranets or whatever, or over the internet or whatever, I want the user to be completely ignorant of where that's running, um, and I want to make it as seamless a kind of experience as possible, including stuff like failover, including stuff like how do, how do we deal with faults, how do we deal with stuff like stateful services. Um, and we're going to go through another one. Th this, this talk actually came just from a chat with someone who was learning Kubernetes. And they were going, I've got a website. It's just a little website, um, just, just one. And it's just some static pages. And I, I, I want to know, how, how do I let people access it? That wasn't their voice, by the way. They've got a very lovely voice, not like mine, anyway. I hate hearing my voice. Um, so I've got a website. OK, you've got a website. And you want to expose it? Yeah. Well, have you got anyone that wants to use it? Yeah, I've got, I've got one person. Oh, awesome. It was them. They wanted to use their own website, right? That's fine. Um, and, and, and it was going to be public. So they were like, okay, so we've got to, oh, oh, don't jump too far ahead. Got to, you know, got to expose it over the internet. Brilliant. Have you, have you got a domain? Yeah, I've got a domain. It's called example.com because, you know, I can't tell you what it really was. Um, and, uh, and what address do you want? I'm going to put it at, at my site.example.com. Oh, brilliant. Okay, so what do I need to do now? Well, You've given them an address, and, and how do people find out where to send their, you know, their, their data, their, their, their packets? Where do they send that stuff? How do they know through the magic of DNS? And, and I never really realized how exciting DNS was, um, but it is, it really is. Uh, there was an old talk, some of you may remember if you, you've got grey hair like me, um, or not much hair like me, uh, by a guy called Chris Boytart. And it was a, you know, I, I always say this, because you know when you're troubleshooting stuff, DNS is always the freaking problem, right? I don't know if you know that's that, but it's, you know, I've said that a lot in my life. Um, it's a great phrase. But DNS also has some amazing abilities that we, that we can use, right? So learning about DNS, learning about something that is so old, in the annals of time, learning about it, learning how to use it for your benefit rather than thinking about creating something new is really you know, where we're gonna go. And we're gonna, we're gonna use some real key principles of DNS through some of the projects when we get towards the end, right? But anyway, DNS. So this is their IP address, right? So, they, so a client knows, they look up the address book of the internet or the address book of networking in DNS. There you go, that's the address. It knows where to send stuff. Cool, it's got that. User hits the website, yes! This person hit their own website and they were very happy. At the end, no. Um, but then it got popular because they told their family about it. Um, and, and so they had, they had more users. And then they were worried. They were worried about the scale. I mean, they had four users. They needed to worry about the scale, right? So, you know, they, they deployed Kubernetes. Of course, they should have done it with just one website, right? Because everyone needs Kubernetes. Of course, you don't all need Kubernetes. Don't always think that. But anyway, um, and so they deployed more pods. Brilliant. But, um, but 
I'm, I can only route stuff to like one of these. I've got one IP address. So I, 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 I need to put a load balancer in front of it. Right, so for my four-person website, um, I need a load balancer. And through that, I've changed the IP address. You know, if you notice, subtle difference. 10.0.0.1, 10.0.10.1, clever, right? Um, and so we haven't changed the address. We've just changed where these packets are going. This is the cool thing about DNS. For a user, you know all this. And it seems really simple, but I like to appreciate the really basic things. It's really important to me to understand that these underpinnings of how the whole internet works, of how all networking works, we take for granted. And yet, they're really important. So spend some time to appreciate them. Anyway, please. Um, yeah, so they've got a load balancer, and they haven't done anything different. They, they, they've, they've just done that, and the user doesn't know any different. Or the user's totally seamless. Cool. But it got so popular, and, and also he wanted to make sure, the reason why he deployed four pods with his static website on, or their static website on, was because they wanted redundancy as well. It wasn't just load. They wanted, like, if one died, they wanted people to still access their super... It was something like Fluffy Cats, I think, that kind of website. Um, and so they put two load balancers in front of it. Brilliant. And so I've got two IP addresses. So now what happens? I've got one name, two IP addresses. OK, what does that mean for a client? How do they know where to send it? Well, they can use either, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They can use either because the response back from DNS is saying, both of these are valid. You can use either of these, All right? I don't mind. It's cool. And then they went global. So they still only had four users, but you know, Two of them were in, in Europe, and two of them were in North America. That fits with the story I'm going to tell. That's why it's like, that's very, very clever what I've done. Um, and so they duplicated everything, right? They, they put up another load of, they brought up another Kubernetes cluster, and they deployed their pods, and they basically duplicated everything. So now they have four IP addresses. Whoa, okay, so I've got no idea where anyone's going. Because they can go to any of these. They're all totally valid as a user to send stuff to. Right, brilliant. Let's do that. If I can remember what window I'm going to. Oh, yeah. So I prefer live demos. I've had to record this because Wi-Fi is always terrible at these things. Um, so, yeah, look, I'm typing. Um, so I'm just doing curl. Just going to hit um, 10. I won't do that every time. Um, so we're hitting an endpoint. I hope you can read that OK. I hope it's, is it big enough? Is it big enough at the back? Yeah, you've got good eyes. I wouldn't be able to read it from up close. I'm, I'm, my eyes are old now. Um, anyway, so we've got this, this address, right? And, and you can see it says Envoy in there um, because I'm using Envoy Gateway. So I'm not actually using Ingress behind the scenes. I'm using the Gateway API, which you've heard loads about this week, right? I'm sure um, already, and you should. It's a brilliant project, so do investigate it. Um, it doesn't make any real difference to what we're going to do here. But I'm just saying, look at Gateway API as a replacement for Ingress. It still gives you Ingress, but anyway. Um, so I'm just going to send 10 requests, and look what happens. Boom, you know, as we thought. So what I've done is, what I've, again, super clever. I've, the stuff I've deployed in Europe says I'm in Europe. You, you get the rest right. <laughs> anyway, so you can see, round robin, I've got four addresses. It's gonna, the, the client's going to be sending to any one of those addresses. Round robin doesn't necessarily mean round robin. It, like, it has a chance. It's an equal chance over time. Right? So that's why you can see the order is not. Now, I don't know if you noticed. I should have said before. Oh, no, we'll see it in a minute. Oh, back to the slides. Ooh. I'm very proud of that, by the way. Um, failure, failure. So what happens then? I've got these four IP addresses, and I've got one address to go to. God, I better hurry up. I talk too much. Right. So what happens if I lose one of my sites? Well, what's going to happen? Oh, by the way, I should have said this at the beginning. What I would do in your position, if I was sat there, is to pick holes in everything I'm doing. Right, so I hope you are, and I hope you're coming up with different ways of doing the same thing, because this is just one way to do stuff. There are a million different ways, and like, yeah, this is, I'm, yeah, anyway. So anyway, we've lost USA. USA is gone. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, so we jump back. We jump back to our wonderful, and what happens in the case of failure? So what we'll do is we'll scale down our EU deployment. Okay, so actually, I've done the opposite of the slides. And I've actually destroyed Europe, not destroyed America. Um, yeah, I'm British. We like to destroy Europe. <laughs> <coughs> I don't. I don't. Anyway, bad joke. Um, anyway, so we're going to hit the same endpoint. And you know what's going to happen, right? Like, you can predict, oh, look, 
Some go through the USA, which I didn't destroy, I've, I've, uh, it runs through, and the other ones don't. We get 503s, gateway, um, timeout, whatever it is. Um, oh, oh, pause there. Oh, no. And I'm just going to say, scaling it back up again. So, by the way, this is in real time. Um, this is the awesomeness of Kubernetes. I know you all know it. But, like, when you're spinning stuff up like this, that wasn't, like, an Apple shortened display. That actually was in real time. When we get later on to the more fun stuff, um, <laughs> we will get there, um, then... It's even more fun. I don't know. I, I can't explain. I get excited by this stuff. Right, back to the slides. So, we said, we take out one of our zones. We don't have a clever way, right? Our users don't have access now to these services that are running there. And of course, there are things we could do. You know, we've got like, multiple load balances. We could scale horizontally. So we've got more redundancy at our ingress level. Um, or we could, uh, you know, we've got more pods there anyway. But, you know, just bear with me. I'm trying to prove a very simple point. Um, and then the other question is about stateful workloads. So there are reasons, requirements, legislation, um, regulation of why some of our workloads can only run in certain regions, right? So you know there may be um, European laws around data can only be stored in European data centers, right? But I still want that data to be accessible from America, right? I just can't store it there. So, so what does that mean? What does that mean in a kind of traditional ingress? So now what I've said is, in Europe, I've, I've deployed uh, static and stateful. Uh, this has gone way beyond this person's website now, by the way. So forget them. This is now mine. Um, so what happens in this case? So what I wanted to do, again, is a bit contrived. Um, I want to hit this at slash stateful. Right. There are other things you could do. Of course, you could set up another DNS entry to point to these new services. Those are, but you know, it doesn't fit with my story. So anyway, we're going to hit it under stateful. Oh, well, let's jump. Before we go there, ooh, no, oh, giving it away. Um, so, what happens when we hit under this address? We, we hit a stateful workload that's only running in one click. You know what's going to happen, right? Um, so, you can see I've got slash stateful at the end of that. And of course, what's going to happen is as it's going to the place where it's deployed, I'm stateful. When it goes to the place where it's not, I'm 404, right? Easy. Just what you expected. Um, and so, what can I do? We can introduce Istio, yay! So I've gone through the really basic stuff of just simple ingress is out, nice and easy, right? We all get that. Um, and then, well, we can introduce Istio now. Well, that's quite a leap sometimes, um, but we're going to go there. Uh, don't be too scared of Istio. It's, if, if you, who's familiar with Istio? Okay, fair number. Good, good, good. It, it can be a bit painful. Learning curve can be a bit painful, and sometimes deployment and troubleshooting can be a bit painful. But the, the, what, it, what it enables you, the, the, the capabilities it, it gives you um, are pretty amazing. And it doesn't have to be Istio, right? A service mesh. I'm just using Istio because, just because, there's no reason. Um, right, so, so with Istio, what we've done is we've deployed the same pods, we've got the service, and you know how Istio has um, these sidecars, these envoy sidecars. We're not going to go through the, the architecture of, of Istio. Um, Istio is the, the control plane for these envoy sidecars, right? The data plane, envoy sidecars in every pod that has it injected, or ambient mesh again. I'm going to gloss over that because I don't know much about it. Um, and we're going to stick with the sidecar one. OK, so we've deployed an ingress gateway. Um, again, this is using the gateway API, by the way. Um, and you can see these things work the same, right? Just, just as before. There's no difference right now. So if I'm hitting either one of those IP addresses, which is now tied to the ingress gateways on here, right? That's the, the middle boxes, the blue ones on the edge. Um, Exactly the same as before. It's being routed to the same cluster. This is, this is, this is cool. This is great. Um, but what, what's, the, what's the benefit? Well, the benefit is, is twofold, actually. So first of all, what happens with stateful workloads? So stateful workloads in, in an Istio world in this way, where I've only got these, these pods, these, these services deployed in one of my regions. Um, if I'm going to the ingress gateway in that cluster where it's deployed, you know, just route straight to it. Simple, there's no difference. And yet it gets clever when we go to one where it's not deployed. And this is where the first benefit comes. Woo! Um, when you hit an ingress gateway in, the other, in your other region, your other cluster, Envoy, sorry, uh, Istio is clever enough to have configured Envoy to route that traffic via MTLS from your ingress gateway, which is effectively just an, an Envoy proxy, route that across to the east-west gateway, another Envoy proxy, um, to, to route that to the stateful service. So as a user now, 
I'm, it doesn't matter. I can hit any one of those lovely four IP addresses. It doesn't matter. It's transparent. Woo. Um, there are other reasons why you wouldn't want to do this, but it's just to prove a point again. Um, now, what happens in the case of failure? This is like the second benefit that we talked about. One was what do we do in failure? And the second one was how do we handle stateful things or services not deployed in, in that same cluster? So what happens if we lose a stateful service, a stateless service, sorry, in, in one of our clusters? Well, just like happened with the stateful service, boom. Immediately, dynamically configured, Istio will then route it over through the Eastwest gateway to, to our stateless service and the other one. So I've got failover. I've got failover between clusters. I've got transparency. I've got um, the, the user doesn't know any of this is happening. It's, it's great, right? really cool. And there's loads of different stuff you can do in here as well. Like remember, Istio gives you so much flexibility in, in that layer. So um, for example, the, the initial configuration I had in here was uh, to actually route to the local service in the cluster first. And then, if that's not available, then fail over to the other cluster. So this is what you can do through, um, is that on the next slide? Oh yeah, that's what you can do through destination rules, for example. So I, so I have the flexibility to configure what my requirements are. My requirement for this demo was to be able to route it to a cluster where it works. Okay, try locally to begin with, and then route across to another one. That's, that's what um, this demo was, uh, was for. Really. So we've sorted out stateful workloads, we've sorted out the ability to make that transparent to the user, and we've sorted out some failover. Oh. Yeah. So what, what, that's fine, but I, I was talking about in this one, like taking out the stateless service. That's easy, because the entry point for the user, the bit where the IP address is tied to, that, that ingress gateway, is still there. So from a user perspective, no, no they, don't, they don't know, right? Because of that routing logic happens. Well, what happens if we lose a whole cluster, right? Or we just lose the ingress gateway, right? What happens to the user at that point? Our services might be running fine behind the scenes, but our ingress gateway may have gone down. Istio can't really help now. You know, of course, you can scale it, you can put redundancy in, but there's always a chance of, you know, some catastrophic network failure. <laughs> and that's where KHGB comes to the rescue, but before we go there, we're going to jump back because I did spend time doing these and I, I, I think you should watch them. Um, <laughs> they may not be very good, but it's fun. I really enjoy it. If you want to know about the tooling I used for this, I found it recently. It's brilliant. Come and ask me about that as much as about any of the other stuff. Right. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so we're going to hit our, our Istio Ingress Global um, endpoint. Right? It's just a slightly different address. I use a different DNS address so I could show in demo. It's got Istio rather than Envoy. Um, and right, exactly the same as before in this case, because everything's up and running. We get that same round robin kind of, you know, although it's slightly skewed towards Europe, that's for no reason. I did this in Europe, by the way. Um, I was going to mention that, yeah. So let's see if we scale down the deployment. We're going to scale down our EU deployment like we talked about, and we hit that global endpoint, and we know what's going to happen here is that everything's going to work, right? Um, because I recorded it before. See? But look, oh, look at the latency. Look at the latency. I recorded this in Europe, by the way. Um, did you see? That? No, it doesn't see much. But some of you work in areas where, where latency is important. Right? So when we go a little bit further on, you'll understand why some of the things that we're going to do with our load balancing, with our global server load balancing, um, why we do them. And that's one of them. Latency, like, that's just from the UK to Oregon, I think this was running in. So it's not far, really. But it still takes time. Latency is, is an issue, right? So we saw that. Every, but totally works for a user. The transparency for the user, they don't know that the service in Europe's gone down. They have a little bit more latency, but they'll survive, right? Maybe. Um, and it comes back up, yeah. Here, see, see the latency here between the European ones and then the, uh, the USA ones. You'll be blown away by it. Oh, God. Do you see that, right? So that's recorded real time. So it does show a difference. You know, I, I, I just found that interesting. I find too many things interesting. Um, that's why I don't sleep very well. Um, what about stateful workloads? Same as we said, we've gone through the slides. So we know what's going to happen. Everything works. So from a user's perspective, this is the same setup. Those four IP addresses to those four load balancers, two in Europe, two in America. Um, 
from a user's perspective, everything is like brilliant. And you know, so, well, I can't remember what the next bit is. Okay, yeah. So, what happens if we lose a region completely? completely? Um, so we'll scale down our, our Istio gateway, um, that ingress gateway, and then we'll hit it again. And we know what's going to happen, right? Again, I've, I've talked through it, so you know what's going to happen. Um, I love spoiling stories. Don't watch a film with me. Um, and we can see that when it's trying to hit the European endpoint, there's a timeout because our ingress gateway is gone. So from, so, we've, so from a user perspective, it's fine when our services go down inside our clusters, but it's not okay when the entry point goes down. So we need to do something about that. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> that, right back to slides there. Okay, so KHGB. Um, what is KHGB? Uh, who's heard of KHGB? I don't even know if I'm saying it right. KHGB, KHGB. Okay, so some of you. Who's heard of um, glo global server load balancing? More of you. Brilliant. Who uses global server load balancing? A few, but you, you know. Okay, so that's, that's an interesting one. So what, everything I'm talking about here, by the way, some of you will be exposing services over the internet. Some of you will be on your own um, intranets, your own networks, and suddenly everything we're doing today applies equally. It does not matter. Um, any, anything we do can apply equally in your own environment to, to the internet as well. Um, so KHGB, ooh, ah, it's a cloud-native Kubernetes global balancer. I think they should have put load in there, but that's what they said, so I'm just quoting them. Um, we know what cloud-native means. Uh, one, of the, one of the key parts of that is just how responsive it is, right? One of the things about cloud-native is to be responsive to change recovery, right? And, and yeah, we'll show that in a minute. Um, Kubernetes is an interesting part of this, right? Why? Why Kubernetes? Because it's everywhere. Everyone wants to run their stuff on Kubernetes. There are loads more global balancers, global load balancers out there in the wild. There are proprietary ones, there are hardware ones, there are software ones, there are SaaS solutions, there's loads of different ones. The fact this runs on Kubernetes is a real benefit. You know, I'm, 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 I, I love the Kubernetes ecosystem, but it means we can run it ourselves really easily. Um, and we'll go through it. Like that's one. That's one of the big things. That not to be necessarily reliant on on other services. If you can run stuff yourself, and there's a low maintenance, low overhead to that, then awesome. So it does it via DNS load balancing. Um, what does that mean? Well, it's going to configure the DNS appropriately for the user, right? Depending on which strategies you want to employ. So as a user, I look stuff up. You remember what I said before? Like I look up a name. I get some IP addresses. Any one of those is valid. What we're doing with KHGB is we're going to go look up the, 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 the DNS name and only return IP addresses that are valid to the user. Those validity rules, uh, you know, they're becoming more rich, shall we say. Um, they, there's a lot more richness needs to happen there. So, so to be honest, right now, there's a few. We'll go through them in a minute. Um, but yeah, so it's using DNS to load balance. So we know when I say load balance, if that reader is directing the traffic to the endpoints that you want to balance, right? It's not doing anything clever connections-wise or anything like that. It's just at the DNS level. But no, that is pretty good. We'll see. Um, there's no single point of failure. This is another part, obviously, a cloud-native kind of stuff. Like single points of failure are bad. Um, scaling is making them HA is, is a really important part. This scales across clusters, which we'll show again in a minute. Um, so there is no single point of failure. And it uses Kubernetes native health checks. So one of the ways that most other um, load balancers, global load balancers work is they all do pings or TCP or HTTP right, like to check um, from outside of the cluster. Now, that happens on a polling interval. It can be uh, slow. It can be non-reactive. Non like there, are, there are problems with it. Right? Doesn't mean it's, 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 it's not perfect. And I think that's useful in conjunction with something like this. Now, KHGB is only based at the moment on Kubernetes native health checks. And when I say Kubernetes native health checks, I mean probes. So um, liveness, readiness probes, really, is that the main ones. So you know with readiness probes, uh, there can be checks inside your application that the kubelet checks every so often. If it fails those probes under a certain timeout and certain you know, uh, failure rate, um, then your, your services, that, that pod, that endpoint, is taken out of service. So no traffic will get routed to it. So KHGB relies on those readiness checks. That makes it more responsive, for one thing. Right? We're running these in cluster. It makes them also more granular, because the checks you can make can be totally, you know, it's up to you how you, you write your readiness probes. You can write them as granular as you want for your specific application, rather than as coarse as, if I hit that, do I get a 200? Right, this is this is the difference. You have the ability to make really granular checks because what Kubernetes provides and KHGB consumes. 
and it's easy configuration. Um, it, it really is. Uh, it is either one CRD or annotations. Um, so, so here we go. This is, this is what we're going to go. One sec, let me grab a drink. While you stare in wonder at YAML. Um, I wish there was something better than YAML for this. But anyway, um, so we can see we've got uh, a CRD, there's an API group version. Um, Oh, I love the Kubernetes API. Like, it's just so great. And like, you, you know what you're looking at. You know what spec means. I haven't got status in here. But you know what spec means. This is what you want, right? I want, and now this is, again, there's some work upstream going on. This uses Ingress, right? It doesn't use Gateway API yet. It will do, but not yet. So you effectively declare your Ingress. And KHGB goes and creates that Ingress object for you. It manages that Ingress object for you at this point. Um, and there's some bits down the bottom around the strategy. So, so the, the ingress part, declaration for your ingress, like what's, what host do you want stuff to come in? What do you recognize? Where do I want to root stuff, path prefix routes, all these kind of stuff that you get with ingress, normal stuff. And then there's a strategy. And down the bottom, um, you can see DNS, TTL, uh, split brain, uh, and type. Um, we'll talk about, well, we'll talk about type and, uh, and TTL in a minute. Um, TTL is such a funny one. Um, it's a, it's a killer in there, especially over the internet. And we'll talk about it now. So <laughs> TTL is, is a timeout, right? Um, DNS is, is, is quite chatty, and because it's such a key part of all networking, pretty much. And, you know, obviously you don't have to use DNS, but you know, we're humans. We want to use something we can, we can um, refer to easily. Um, because it's such a key part, it needs to be protected. So, so TTL is a way of, of having a, a hierarchy of, of resolvers. So I send my request to my local resolver. I actually got it running on my laptop. I'm using system and system D anyway. Um, don't kill me. And um, yeah, that then routes it to other DNS servers, which then route it to other DNS servers. So it's, it's kind of a hierarchy, right? And that TTL, that time to live, is telling these DNS servers how long the authoritative source, the actual root source of this, how long it should be available for until it expires, right? Um, I can set this to five. Now, this is great if you're running in your own environment where you control all those caching resolvers along that chain. If you're going over the internet, one thing you learn is you've got no control over TTL. It's a suggestion, right? You can't say, I want five seconds. Because go to Google, you'll have a minimum of 60 seconds. Um, I can't remember the other one that I found the other day. It was like 300 seconds. So you can't, you don't have total freedom over that, over the internet. So you do have to be aware of that. It's one thing to bear in mind. Um, and type round robin in this case. So basically, what we're going to do with this initial one is just to, um, oh yeah, we better get going. Uh, is, is just to basically do the same thing as we had before. Um, you can also do it through annotations on Ingress. Um, depends what you like. I much prefer using an API. I much prefer explicitness over over annotations. Perfect personally, but you know it works. And so this is the uh, the secret source that's going on. So. There's a few components in here, right, just to go through. Um, these are all ones, well, not all of them, the core DNS, the KHGB controller, and the external DNS are all part of the KHGB deployment. So this core DNS is not your cube DNS, right? It's not your in-cluster DNS server. This is another one. And there's a reason for that, which we'll get to in a second. Um, KHGB controller watches that GSLB resource. External DNS. Um, Again, we'll talk about that in one second. But again, what I love about this is the ability of composing projects. Each of these projects has their own purpose. Tightly controlled, tightly tight scope of that. Composing functionality from existing applications is, is, is a great thing, right? We don't need to build the world. Use what's there, especially in the CCF, CNCF, CNCF ecosystem. Um, right, so KHB controller, it watches the core DNS ingress. It gets the address for that core DNS ingress. Because what we're going to do is expose core DNS as the authoritative um, uh, DNS server for the zone, for the delegated zone. And, you know, these may be some terms uh, that I may have time to go on. But this is, again, the key part. DNS works like this from the very root. Delegation of DNS is, is a key part. Okay, so um, KXGB controller read the ingress for uh, the core DNS. Um, the, what is the address? Like, what's the load balancer that's going to? What's the IP address that external clients will come in to see? And, and it writes some DNS endpoints. That's part of the external DNS API. Um, 
it writes that to um, the Kubernetes API. Now, this external DNS is also another external DNS. You may already be using external DNS. And for those of you that don't know what external DNS is, it's a way of using CRDs to tell um, uh, external DNS to go and manipulate your actual DNS entries. Right? It works with most DNS um, providers, cloud providers, or your own, or bind, or whatever. Um, and so this is actually another configuration. You may be running external DNS. This can also work alongside that. Um, so it writes these DNS endpoints to, uh, to the API server, and then external DNS reads those, and it writes to your DNS provider some information. And those information, it, that information is the name servers, the addresses of these core DNS pods, or these, or these core DNS ingress. It writes those as the name servers for your delegated zone. Now, what a delegated zone is in DNS is when you look up a DNS entry, it kind of asks the, 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 your, your resolvers, and your resolvers then know where to delegate that to. This goes all the way back to the .com domain or any of these TLDs, goes back to that to know actually which DNS servers to delegate the, that request to. So what we're doing here is we're setting up our own zone delegation inside our own core DNS. Okay, the second thing that KHEB does is it reads healthy endpoints. We talked about that. It uses the readiness probes. It reads those, and it writes more DNS endpoints to the API server, but with a different label or different annotation. So external DNS ignores it, but core DNS with a custom plugin doesn't ignore it. Okay, so that core DNS plugin that runs in core DNS reads these DNS endpoints and exposes it. User, look up stuff just like normal, totally transparent to the user, and then looks up the address, and that lookup, final lookup, actually is delegated to the core DNS part of the KHEB deployment. All right. So all this change in your external DNS is setting up this delegated zone, and it's all done through these pieces. So you haven't, you've, all you've done is set up your GSLB um, and some values when you've deployed KHEB, but that's trivial. Right, we, well, before we jump there, back to my amazing demo. Um, There's your GSLB. There's your endpoints. OK, so there's, there's a few things in here. This is the DNS endpoints for your zone delegation for the core DNS ingress. Um, you can see this initial one. I want to point with my finger, but you can't see that. And if I roll my mouse, oh, can you see that? Yeah, maybe here. Um, this is uh, setting up name servers for your delegated zone, which in this, this case is that. And it uses some naming conventions in here so that when we have this no single point of failure, both our um, deployment in the EU and a deployment of KHEB in, in the US, they're both doing the same thing, right? They're trying to write to our DNS provider with these, these addresses. And then they have one different one, which is the local ingress endpoint. Okay, so each one of our KHEB external DNS deployments updates the name servers for our delegate zone, to, um, that's our delegated zone, and the glue record, which helps DNS to um, know where to route the requests to our uh, um, uh, delegated name servers. So we just show the same in, uh, in, in the other one. So you see you've got different addresses, different targets at the bottom, um, depending on which one we're in. Yeah, we'll just skip this quickly. So these are the actual endpoints. These things get updated um, on, on the fly. Yeah, just showing that it's the same in both uh, both regions. And then loads of stuff here, because I wanted to show you one thing. Like this, this is in round robin mode. We're going to currently a stupidly long command to run it in a, uh, an Amazon machine in, uh, in, in Europe. And look, round robin, Z, blah, 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 blah. Other load balancing strategies um, gloss over quickly. But the one we're going to look at is GOIP, because uh, we have nearly run out of time. But it's fine. He said I could overrun a little bit. Um, so we just patch it. We change this value. A type the GOIP. It uses uh, MaxMind database format. And so if we're in Europe, now this is the first bit of cleverness from KHEB. We got there in the end, right at the end. Um, if I'm in Europe, oh look, I'm only sending stuff to Europe because of DNS load balancing. So I've chosen a strategy which says send clients to their closest endpoints. All right, if you want to you know, find out about more about MaxMind Geo um, database format, it's really clever. Um, it's not really, but it is. Uh, yeah, and if I'm in the US, then I get routed to the US, obviously. Boom. It's clever. And yeah, that's just it. Uh, yeah. 
Go on. That's just showing. So we're done. We're done. I could keep talking about it, but oh, thank you. If you want to run through the demo, it's at the bottom there. There's the GitHub repo. You can see all the stuff's in there. Um, does anyone have any questions? You've probably got like a couple of minutes because I've talked too much. Any questions? Yeah, you. You. Oh, it's a good one. Um, it would be better to. Would it be easier to, is a different question. Like, to set up your own Anycast implementation is actually pretty tricky. Um, so, yeah, for my demo, you know. But, like, um, there are other requirements around that. The clients have to understand Anycast as well. Um, <laughs> Come and talk to me afterwards. Yeah. So, uh, your perspective is from the... Oh, sorry. Hello. <laughs> so, it's like, where's it coming from? So, your perspective is from the um, internet user to access your server. But what if uh, my application is running inside of service mesh? So, the application is com uh, community to the inside of the cluster. Are you able to solve the same issue? I, I, if things are running inside the cluster, I don't think you need to. I think your service mesh will take care of that kind of for you. you um, th there, there may be plugins for your service mesh to do stuff like routing to local services, um, but, it's, but this is all about your ingress. This is all about the external access to your servers. This is the layer that KHEB provides on top. So it's not able to louder from the, um, let's say your app backend is value. You're not able to loud to the another clusters Bacon. Um, no, no. Come and have a chat. Let's see what okay. if you want. Okay. Anything else? Very quickly. It's been brilliant. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed that. So take care. Enjoy the rest of your week. Bye. <laughs>